Hello, this is David welcoming you to another D&D History Hub podcast. In this episode, I'm going to talk about this book and its author. It's the um, making of the English working class by E.P. Thompson, which was first published in 1963. I first came across it quite some years ago now, when I was studying uh, modern history at uh, university, uh, from which I graduated with uh, first class honours. It absolutely blew me away, this book. All 848 pages of it in this edition, which uh, incidentally I borrowed as an alumnus from the library of my uh, old university, um, Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. I'm a sucker for good writing, and boy, could the author E.P. Thompson write like a dream. And the book was also of special interest to me, because I come from a working class background myself. I grew up on a council housing estate, or social housing in other words, in the north of England in the 1950s and 60s. My parents and our neighbours were working class, and I think they were proud to identify that way. Uh, many of the fathers and grandfathers on the estate, mine included, had served in combat in World Wars uh, I and II. By and large, these people voted for the British Labour Party because in those days it represented the interests of the low paid, the agricultural labourers, shop assistants, factory workers, railway workers, clerks and the like. Um, they voted for the Labour Party, but um, Marxism, though, was anathema to them, I think. So, who was E.P. Edward Palmer Thompson? Well, for starters, he wasn't working class. He was a bit of a posh lad, really. He was um, born to uh, Methodist missionary parents who sent him to... Uh, independent schools and then uh, later he went to Corpus Christi College at Cambridge University. Now EP saw active service in World War II as a tank commander and he fought in that pretty nasty Italian campaign including at the fourth battle of Monte Cassino uh, April May 1944. Very tragically his older brother Frank was killed on active service in Bulgaria at the age of just 25. After the war and back in civilian life, E.P. Thompson joined the Communist Party of Great Britain, and in 1946 he set up the Communist Party Historians Group, alongside other British historians whose names you might recognise, such as um, Eric Hobsbawm and Christopher Hill. He resigned from the Communist Party in 1956, but he remained um, an ardent left-wing socialist who he went on to take a leading role in the campaign for nuclear, nuclear disarmament. Incidentally, there are quite a few videos of uh, E.P. Thompson on YouTube. You just uh, search on his name, and a lot of them are actually quite interesting. Now, The Making wasn't his only book. Uh, there were several others, including... Um, very good uh, biography of the 19th century socialist and artisan um, William Morris, which I also studied during my degree. And he also did a withering takedown in his book, The Poverty of Theory, of the um, French structuralist Louis uh, Althusser, um, who actually, in a very postmodern way, makes appearance in Laurent Binet's work of fiction, the Seventh Function of Language, which um, great book, by the way. Got nothing to do with E.P. Thompson, but um, a lot to do with postmodernism. It's not postmodernist, but it might be, but um, very funny. Now, I think you can detect elements of um, E.P. Thompson's Marxist thinking in the making, particularly uh, elements of um, dialectical materialism, the, the clash of ideas or structures synthesising into, uh, into a new paradigm. And he also positioned himself as a historian 
from below. That is, going beneath the prevailing ruling narrative or structure to bring out the lost uh, voices of the time. Uh, back when I was at school, for example, when we studied the Industrial Revolution, it was all about like machines and uh, you know in improving productivity, the spinning Jenny and the Bessemer converter and stuff like that. And then it wasn't so much about the horrendous conditions. So I think that's what it means. At the very beginning of the making, which covers the period from uh, 1780 to 1832, which is an enormous uh, change and disruption, a time of enormous change and disruption, um, Thompson tells us his agenda. He is, he writes, seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the Luddite cropper, the obsolete handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded followers of Joanna Southcott from the enormous condescension of posterity. He says, their crafts and traditions may have been dying. Their hostility to the new industrialism may have been backward looking. Their communitarian ideals may have been fantasies. Their insurrectionary conspiracies may have been foolhardy. But they lived through these times of acute social disturbance, and we did not. Thompson argues that class is not a structure, but it's a relationship based on common experience and interests. It's a cultural as much as an economic formation, he argues. He says that the impact of the Industrial Revolution on these emerging working classes was truly catastrophic. The people were subjected simultaneously to an intensification of two intolerable forms of relationship, those of economic exploitation and of political oppression. Relations between employer and labourer were becoming harsher and less personal, and at each point where workers sought to resist exploitation, they were met by the forces of the employer or state, and commonly both. For most working people, he says, the crucial experience of the Industrial Revolution was felt in terms of the changes in the nature and intensity of exploitation. The process of industrialization must, in every conceivable social context, entail suffering and the destruction of an older and valued way of life, he says. So not a lot of white privilege going on there. It was a period of mass immiseration and suffering. He says the process of industrialization was carried through with exceptional violence in Britain. This violence was done to human nature. The new economic conditions, the new alienation of the work process itself cast the blackish shadow over the years of the Industrial Revolution, he writes. There was a drastic and horrible increase in the intensity of exploitation of child labour between the years 1780 and 1840, especially in the mining industry. Very dangerous uh, place. Lots of uh, deaths there. His book is chock full of examples and anecdotes from the lives of real people who lived and suffered through the turmoil. Now one thing I would like to highlight out of the mass of detail in this book is, is you cannot cover all of it uh, in, a, in a short lecture. So I'm going to just choose one and that's Thompson's analysis of the role of the Protestant Christianity in the period. And he especially puts the focus on the activities and theology of the Protestant Methodist Church. Faith in a life to come, he writes, served not only as a consolation to the poor, but also as emotional compensation 
for present sufferings and grievances. As well, though, the church also saw itself as having the duty to inculcate in them the virtues of obedience and industry. Once within the, uh, the Methodist societies, he writes, the converted were subjected to discipline that included the duty to abstain from marriage outside of the societies and to be distinguished by their dress and by the gravity of their speech and manners and to avoid the company even of relatives who were still in Satan's kingdom. Thompson declares it is difficult not to see in Methodism in these years a ritualized form of psychic masturbation. It's a great phrase. Energies and emotions which were dangerous to social order or which were merely unproductive were released in the harmless form of sporadic love feasts, watch nights, band meetings or revivalist campaigns. And here, as, as I mentioned earlier, we see the dialectic begin to play. So because Methodism and other Protestant religions is Bible-centred, Poor, humble people were taught to read and write, and many served as local preachers and class leaders, which gave them self-respect and experience in speaking and in organisation. And these are just the things you need as, say, a trade union organiser, a pamphleteer, a campaigner for human rights and justice in a world scarred by the violence of industrialism, and many of them do. Anyway, there is so much more to this book. This is just a tiny taste. If you ever get the opportunity, I recommend that you give it a read. Um, if you like this talk, uh, please uh, give us a thumbs up, like, and uh, consider subscribing. So thank you for listening. Goodbye.